Canterbury Tech is proudly sponsored by Lumen PDF, Crescent Consulting, UC School of Business, and AWS. Many thanks to our event sponsor, Jix, and our venue host, the University of Canterbury School of Business. As a Canterbury Tech member, you can receive a 10% discount on all short courses under the Executive Education and Industry Programme. You can do this by emailing execed at canterbury.ac.nz. More member benefits coming soon. <laughs> My name is Sekou Skandan. I am going to be an MC for the night and I'm terribly sorry for putting you through this uh, brutal affliction and I'm grateful you have paid for it. Uh, so I'm going to start with introducing Luisa. Hello Luisa. Hello. Yeah, great. So uh, I'm going to give the mic or baton to her and then I'll come back. Good evening, everyone. I am the new GM of Canterbury Tech, Louisa Taylor. This is my second meeting, so very exciting. I just wanted to tell you about this piece of paper that was on your um, chair. So obviously we're being hosted tonight by JITS and you see um, the University of Canterbury. And I wanted to announce that we're now starting to provide member benefits. So if you are a member of Canterbury Tech, you can now get 10% off any short course provided by the Executive Education um, Program at UC. So if you want to take advantage of that, then you can email um, execed at canterbury.ac.nz and mention that you are a member. Don't buy it online because you won't get the, the discount, but if you email them at execed at canterbury.ac.nz and mention that you're a member of Canterbury Tech, then you can take advantage of that. And we're going to be um, also uh, rolling out some other member benefits over the next few months, so watch that newsletter. Thanks very much, everyone. So, our first speaker is Jix, and Jix is an Otatahi born and bred five year old creative tech innovation agency that focuses on developing an immersive and interactive visual experiences. And Shakti is the founder and design technologist of Jix and the chief innovation officer of Nararu, a Taranaki based EV. So, with an educational background in computer science engineering, graphic design, and human computer interaction, Shakti and his team specialize in creating digital experiences as such. Introducing Shakti. Hello, Shakti. Thank you for a wonderful host. Kira Tina Koto, no my Aramai Kitene Kuriru, Ko Shakti Pri Balaji Ranganathan, Toko Ingua. Okay, so from, I don't need to introduce, but I, right? <clears throat> I came to New Zealand as an international student and this is my starting point. I did my research upstairs in Human Interface Technology Lab. Going into this entrepreneurship world without having a business, uh, without having a business acumen or even a background, what made me to, uh, what made me to realize that what I'm doing is good, you know, in terms of uh, the technology, in terms of uh, demos. So all I had is some prototype. And I came to this uh, startup ecosystem and showed the prototype and demos and said, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And I don't have a business plan. You still don't. I still don't have a business plan. <laughs> so that's, that's, how I, uh, that's how we started. To be honest, uh, the ecosystem sustained us. So I want to talk, talk to you all about how did we survive? You know, what made me to make the decision of uh, coming into this immersive media and virtual reality and augmented reality and now we are surviving. So I'm going to pick up on some points where we believe it's happening. Uh, so 
the the evolution of technology in network as you can see you know we have gradually progressed from 1g 2g to 5g so what that 5g means we always talk about low latency and high bandwidth what does it exactly mean it's it's basically an example what we built 5 years ago a person who is playing a cricket and the latency in which she can play a cricket ball is is an example of virtual reality but what we could do today is someone can bowl from australia and you can still play with that uh, low latency and bandwidth so i'm going to take some of my points and plot that into a graph and see where we come from so i've taken that uh, network graph and plotted from a timeline the next thing i want to talk about is computer vision so computer vision is drastically improved from identifying and recognizing a qr code to smart as uh, you know we can uh, you, the computer vision has become so powerful that it is recognizing human objects and pretty much everything that you see in real world which which is uh, practically applied in uh, some of our uh, real time example like you know branding uh, making a visual object come to life and even running safety check uh, for a health and safety uh, reason so i'm going to take the computer vision and plot it back into the base graph the next one is actually film making as you understand most of us uh, realize where the film uh, making process started with this grunty big camera and you know how uh, uh, the first movie has been made with uh, uh, toy story and the evolution of computer graphics and now the same technology is used uh, it, it's evolved over the time and it's not just about the network and computer vision the other evolution is also uh, uh, getting uh, motion capture and you know bring making it more accessible as you can see in the latest uh, in, in the film making virtual reality is used to actually see and uh, plan some of those movie and how it is uh, uh, featured so i'm going to take that and again plot a graph so why am why, why am i doing it because uh, this is the fundamental uh, aspect of uh, you know uh, making technology through this uh, journey so the next one i'm going to talk about is actually animation uh, from the stop motion animation with the sequence of uh, making this animation come to life with feature films and uh, uh, the the other technologies are motion capture and you know film uh, are used inside it so this this is the evolution of uh, film uh, making and computer graphics so it's not just uh, so sort of taking back into plotting that same graph and talking about virtual reality the first headset looks like that in the past that's that's how bulky it was and same way look at the machine in the background you know it is it needs a grunty machine more powerful aspect and it has become more accessible but still you need to carry the machine in the backpack and look what we have got today with wireless headsets so the evolution in the hardware has also drastically changed the way we uh, see the content in virtual reality it's not just the hardware component it is also the computer the quality of graphics which is achieved uh, in in the example like that's 10 year old work that we did for a training simulation for driving and then to the graphic that you see in the convention center video so the the level of graphics and the quality has drastically increased and which has made access to the content these are some example of uh, the convention center the uh, antarctic center and how realism the graphics can be so it's it's, it's more about you are immersing into the realistic aspect of uh, the virtual world it makes you more believable so i've plotted that same graph into the uh, base diagram the next part is augmented reality so it's not just uh, head mounted displays and handheld devices become smarter all these big giants like facebook google uh, and microsoft are all acquiring other startups and evolving this into their r&d and making making it more uh, accessible so we are proud to like you know the first magic book was actually designed in hitler you know that's something a proud moment and breakthrough in technology uh, in in which how people have seen uh, it grow and even the uh, hardware got sleeker the future is like you know the contact lens might replace all these head mounted display 
and some of the examples are you know used in medical it's, that's a simulation that we did on head handle devices and uh, even large screen augmented reality for retail and marketing and in even some of the most accessible headset with uh, with the content creation and visualizing museum artifacts and again in health and safety and training applications are augmented reality as used in quite a wide application and learning uh, in also learning module so augmented reality is not just on the uh, handle devices or a head mounted display it can also be used on projection mapping and you know you can uh, you can simulate different terrain on top of uh, augmented reality sandbox so i've taken all these factors and put together into one evolution with the timeline so this is the time where i thought maybe even without a business plan even without a, uh, a clear ideology of what i'm going to uh, do with the business but we could survive so that's the confidence that i got it's not just because of one factor it's evolution of uh, computer vision network uh, uh, animation capability video production um, and augmented and virtual reality so everything coming together and it, there's been a speculation a lot of time in the past that the wave is going to hit everything is going to change this is going to be the next television this is going to be the next uh, the next thing and it's going to replace the existing one but it's not so if we look back it's always there is a threat and there is a new medium it's just the way we see the world in reality is like we see we interact with real humans we actually walk we we enjoy this real world through our human eyes and we process and take the world so that cannot be replaced by a virtual world or a metaverse or threat that we are having instead what we could do is make more meaningful content you know uh, fight against the content which is which is making the world a bad place rather how can we change the way we learn and what can we uh, uh, what can we create so that you know the world becomes a better place that's some of the motivation behind how we got into the business uh and it is also the massive adoption curve and the content the hunger for the content so there's a lot of requirement for the content uh by the industry by the film by the entertainment by education everywhere there's a huge demand for the content so uh that's that's actually the expectation that's actually the uh that's actually uh, the opportunity that we lies in in the future so imagine imagine a movie you know you're just not watching a movie you can be part of the movie imagine you can change the the narration of the movie because you are affecting the character inside the movie that's the power virtual reality or uh, it's given to the audience instead of uh, it's of we just viewing a uh, something we are actually making change and uh, we can define the story lines some of the other examples are in retail uh, business application we have created some apps to visualize in home finishing industry and uh, you know uh, running health and safety checks around sorry uh, and and uh, some of the remote work and remote work uh, assistance so yeah we have uh, so this is the future of events so we have created some virtual events and you can actually go to the event if you're not attending uh, and you can go on virtually and you can uh, attend so we are proud to uh, you know come across this milestone of five years with an industry where people say that you know the market is too small and uh, the market is too small it's not good enough for new zealand but looking back you know we just had only crisis point and we could survive in this industry without a business plan it's just because of the technology <laughs> so it's it's about what we are having uh, what we are realizing today it's the convergence of immersive media convergence of uh, all these technology coming nicely together which is giving a lot of opportunity for content creators so i i invite everyone to be part of this ecosystem and create good content and you know that's how we can make this world a better place thank you Thank you, thank you, Shakti, for the wonderful presentation to give us a hint of what the future holds, and I also for finishing the presentation on time. Thank you. Uh, um, so, two minutes of silence for others who didn't understand anything we had mentioned. Please come and talk to us after. Um, so, our next speakers.
literally packs the crunch and epitomizes the essence of and image of indigenous innovation, champions in creative tech sector. Mahi Studios. Wait, let me put this guy. Cool, yeah, that one. Mahi Studios is a co papa Maori production studio that develops digital content grounded in Mazurunga, Maori, Tikanga, and Tipuna values for local and global audiences. They bring end to end digital content and software solutions to Aotearoa and the world for uh, government, environmental, and educational agencies. Vincent Egan, uh, he is a PhD candidate in comms design, master of design, and he's a co-founder and director. And Madison, he's a co-founder and cinematographer who is trying to create film and digital Maori content uh, from New Zealand. In short, they're ultra cool. Please don't blink, okay? <laughs> Come on. Studios. My name is Vincent Egan, as we're um, introduced right now, um, and this is my colleague here, Madison Henry. We founded Maui Studios roughly eight years ago um, down in North Sapoti after we finished our degrees. Um, but before we jump into our, um, our presentation today, we just want to do a quick karakia for you guys. E Maui e, ruku te ate taha, ruku te ate pai, ruku te ate roto, ruku te ate waho. Mm -hmm. Here the how of Matua Kore, Kiaro, Arodani, Kiaro, Tehana, Kiahanaro, Tukura, Teo, Tefakaro, Kiarere, no, Tukura, Terere, Kunga, Katere, no, Komau, Hana, Komau, Kukina, Komau, Waira, Komau, Hina, Tukunaina, Parara, Tiwari, Motianaine, Motiana Mata, Tukuru, Fitifakamoka, Kiatina, Tuna, Homi, Hui, Paiki, Mean. So I really appreciate you guys saying that karakia alongside us. And that's one that was crafted specifically for Maui Studios, as well as like those people that are innovators or interested in technology um, that want to imbue their kaupapa or whatever it is that they're doing with that, the modi of Maui Tiki Tiki Ataranga. And that's the namesake for our organization, Maui mm -hmm. Studios. And so what we're going to show you guys today is just a little bit of the content and stuff that we um, have developed over the last eight years. Bit of an origin story as to why we called Maui Studios and why we picked that name, um, and then some of the technologies and things we've been leveraging, working alongside organisations like Jix to be able to make some really like amazing immersive technologies and things that can do some really amazing um, community good. So that's Madison and I um, when we first started our company, and that was a graphic novel that we both um, we developed because it's 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 like a reimagining of Maui in the sun. And what we really liked about that story was um, Maui wished to go, like, he had this momentous task that he wanted to undertake. It was a massive goal that he wanted to achieve. Um, and so it kind of speaks of all the different areas of entrepreneurship um, because he had this massive goal that he wanted to achieve. He needed to be able to communicate it. Um, he needed to be able to rally a whole bunch of people behind him to be able to achieve that task and then to take action and then to make it happen. But we also like the ambition of them to think, to look up in the sun and to see something that's so crazy and huge and fiery and believe that he could slow it down with his own power. And so that kind of what got us into the whole storytelling aspect and what are different ways that we could leverage storytelling to be able to, I don't know, spread these sorts of messages in a way that will engage with different audiences and people that were interested in the same things that we are. So... You know, we grew up with things like Dragon Ball Z and comic books and all those sorts of things. But we grew up with, and like, it's not to like fuck itzy or to belittle some of the content that had been made before us, but it didn't have the same level of engagement as some of the modern content did. And so we took it upon ourselves to be able to be change agents in that space and leverage these amazing New Zealand stories and then like channel them in a way that people could engage with and um, connect with, which is something that's really important. So. These are some examples of stories that we've told alongside iwi members, like real conservative um, thinking people, but working alongside them, we've been able to recreate them in ways that can engage the rangatahi and the generations to follow. And this is the sort of reactions that we get out of some of these kids. And um, like that kid in particular, where is he? Just up there, he's like, <laughs> how kind of crazy excited he is to, I don't know, see a book. And it's crazy, it's like, taking those traditional mediums and then connecting them with these emerging technologies and amazing trends and things that are happening and then being able to create those sorts of um, responses from people. And like something that's really important about all of that is 
that there are some kids that are at risk or like never really engaged with school and then seeing the content packaged in this way, leveraging these sorts of technologies gives them the confidence to be able to stand up and go, actually maybe learning is pretty cool or maybe I do want to go to school because it's a little bit more interesting to me. Um, and I think like even you can, if, if you could just engage one of those kids and get them like, off the streets or doing bad sort of things, um, getting them back into school and learning and that sort of thing, I think that makes all that effort kind of worth it. Um, and so, like, what's amazing about that is it's taken these kind of flat 2D traditional ways of approaching those old stories and then bringing them into the digital age and having 3D like, immersive versions of them. Um, and so, working alongside JICs and organizations like theirs, we've been able to create those in different ways. It adds another layer of communication to them because it's not just a flat thing down. You can have special effects, you add um, like animation, you can add music and stuff to them, but some of the stuff that we find is most important is having the voices of their own tupuna or their kaimata or their own people to be the voice of the narration. And it's a way of being able to archive some of those cultural stories so that it can last, you know, um, well, let's say a few generations down, being able to hear the voice of one of your past um, great grandparents or something like that, being able to reconnect with them in that way and hear their voice and then to tell you more about who you are as a person based on your lineage. Um, and so those sorts of technologies continue to evolve and so have we as an organization where we've had these like low fidelity, I suppose, 3D models and things that had some sort of a, a certain level of representation based on the technology that we're using, so augmented reality. And as the technology is evolving, and <clears throat> you can get higher fidelity outcomes. And so that's leveraging MetaHuman to be able to recreate like tupuna members based on descriptions or old photographs and the like. Um, and then you see how there's that sort of level of representation, but as the culture of New Zealand continues to grow, it's something that's kind of being recognised by the wider world. And so this is an example that we talked about during the Q&A, but I just wanted to show an example of uh, Mad Maggie, who's a Māori character that we co-designed with Apex Legends and uh, Respawn Entertainment for EA Games, and, and offered them a strategy as to how they could better represent their char um, characters instead of going through traditional routes that they've had of just classic cultural misappropriation. Um, just wanted to share that example. And so, um, developing those, developing upon those cultural spaces and developing them to things that are a little bit more interactive, whereas we see a lot these days of people wanting to engage more with like Māori concepts and things, but there's a lot of kind of shyness of whakamā of how, how to approach those sort of things, how to learn te reo Māori or mā te reo Māori concepts. Um, what are some tools and things that we can develop to help people access those and whether it's a browser-based outcome or something they can get onto their computers to be able to explore these places in the comfort of their own homes um, yeah, without that same kind of shyness, I suppose, that can come with it. Going to an actual marae and there's so much uncertainty. How, where do I stand? How do I hungi? Do I take my shoes off? How are some ways that I'm like, not being disrespectful, I suppose. So um, developing tools and things based on that same um, technology to make it a little bit more immersive, a little more interactive, um, interesting to look at, and you can do it in your own time. And so, I, like I suppose that speaks to um, leveraging the technology to be able to tell stories, and then what are some other ways that we can bring those technologies together to tell different stories in more engaging and interactive ways, and this is all made in Unreal Engine, but that kind of leads on to being able to leverage that with filmmaking to get into that virtual production space, which is what Mads going to talk about now. Yeah, cool. So I suppose like a big part of um, like us starting off as like illustrators and designers and creatives, like you just go down the, the path of like through business and entrepreneurial pursuits. And eventually, eventually we found ourselves like um, we couldn't do everything. So we, could, we couldn't, um, we, we couldn't be across all parts of the business at once. So um, being able to find talented individuals and other people who are, super skilled as well. That's been sort of a part of our co popper over the last like eight years is just finding new people as we go. Um, so I suppose like in terms of like screen outcomes, um, ma mainly designing now for less, um, less towards the, the graphic design, like we still do all the, the print outcomes and everything as well. Mm -hmm. But I suppose like nowadays, um, the absorption of like um, content um, with screen is just so easy because like I don't want to tell you how everyone has a phone, da da da. So um, being able to make film, being able to make games, is just a natural evolution. And so for us, we started off, we were born um, in the whānau order space, I guess, um, when it first came out, the whānau order commissioning agency of the South Island. 
came down and what they would do is um, provide funding for groups, social enterprise groups, Māoris, Pacifica, people who are willing to make um, impact in their communities for the better. And so we, we actually just started going around filming um, those groups, their pitch ideas and stuff. And over time, um, we ended up just landing jobs where we were able to tell those stories um, on the regular. And so over the past, yeah, six or seven years, we've been able to tell final water stories and they've unlocked the doors to heaps of experiences. Um, this one is such, I got a call from a fellow called Ian Taylor and he's um, part of um, ARL Research and he was just like, hey mate, I need you to um, go on a voyage across the ocean. I uh, can't tell you too much details, but I'll just jump on a plane. And um, So a part of it um, was to be involved in our waka kaupapa, um, to be able to retell some of the migration story um, for the waka voyages. And um, what was really awesome was I just went there and researched and, and got to meet the crew. And I thought I was just filming, but actually I was, um, you know, I was a part of the kaupapa, so I had to be on crew, I had to be on watch. You know, our watch was 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then outside of that, I also had to film and figure out things to do. Um, so it was, you know, I was the only one with technology as well. Everyone else was, um, it was a celestial voyage. So it was like, it was really about, you know, stripping back and I guess like telling the stories on camera. It was really awesome because as I got to know the people more and we sort of got more and more involved in the, um, in the process. And so... These are just an, um, an example of like um, how film can take you around the world, I guess. And so now it's up to us as like being Māori, how are we going to, um, I guess, what is the representation of Māori stories? Like how do we go about telling that? And it's such a hot topic right now. And um, I guess like with us, we're, we started off in the space of um, documentary web series and all that, but now we're really moving towards the creative narrative, music videos, um, harnessing technology and combining with, um, them. So... I guess as well, like part of um, some of my research was around like the rules of engagement in Māori spaces, um, practices that affect or tell Māori stories, um, the, the practices and the processes. So some of um, the content that I came back with at the end of my studies was just around some of the um, a cultural framework for engagement. So, um, so it's the, the tangata, the people involved in the story, um, pūrāko, the story itself, and tūkama. So that's the process. So those three interwoven into each other helps give you like a general framework. And really it's all about um, the whakapapa of um, the thing and then moving forward from there. Um, yeah, so it's actually, it's a lot more deep and intense than that, but um, I, I'm happy to share a lot of my research after this anyway. Um, so at the start of 2021, um, we had the opportunity to invest in um, some LED technologies. And so um, I don't know if uh, virtual production is um, a big hot topic here happening here in Canterbury as well. Mm -hmm. um, Screen Canterbury, Christchurch NZ, um, Dovedale, there's all this stuff happening or people are doing awesome film things. And I think it's really important for, because we have such a beautiful funeral here in, um, here in the South Island and um, a lot of the commercial industry work, of course, is in the North Island as, as such. But um, what, I, what we would like to... I guess what we're trying to push is to show that actually now that's not true, that we can create opportunities down here as well. And mm. I guess just opening up facilities like even the Dovedale campus and even Maui, we have the opportunity to be able to um, utilize technologies like these. So here's a crew ruffle creative. They came through to our space. Um, and so they were able to do like a commercial with Jax Hamilton. She's like a master chef and um, basically take her from being in the kitchen and then opening it up and being on a beach, a virtual beach in Jamaica. So um, just stuff like that. So if you guys aren't familiar with virtual production, it requires three key technologies, um, an Unreal Engine environment that like responds in real time to cameras, um, 3D camera tracking technology, um, which is sort of like a way to connect the cameras um, to the movement, and then an LED, LED wall, which is the backdrop. Um, so here's just like some examples of us being able to um, utilizing this technology and ways to create outcomes. And also, I guess, um, over the past year, we've just had the chance to be able to, I guess, um, explore the, the technology because it is quite new. And um, I guess early in the year, we went to LA and we had the chance to see their studios and the scale of what they're doing over there. It is um, something that's being demanded at the moment, virtual production and, and 
for people to be able to be upskilled in this industry. So there is a there is a large calling for um, people. So it's kind of good that there's like courses on campus and stuff that are happening. Um, and so one of the projects that I wanted to share just before we wrap up is um, a project that we worked on with an artist called Rob Ruha, um, one of his new music videos. And um, we had the chance to create this virtual world, right? So we came together in Wananga and um, this was created in Unreal Engine. And it's just basically the brief for the music video was we want you to create a Maori utopia metropolis, um, sci-fi, Blade Runner, anything you can imagine. So we're like, okay. Um, and so part of our role is trying to think how do we interweave uh, a combination of those elements and put him performing his music in that environment. So a part of it was going, obviously, establishing the digital environment, um, having the physical environments around Christchurch where we could drop them into, and as well as weaving the two, so um, creating the, the digital background and having, um, yeah, having the set design and lighting in the foreground. Um, so here's just an example of some of the artworks um, shared by um, people involved around the sector as well in different, um, so these artworks here, um, Art for Tea, Shadaki Creative, City Council, Paimonu, and yeah, I guess we spent three days um, filming with them to develop this set. And what was really awesome about it was that it was just something that I guess like none of us had really um, experienced before. Um, it was a, a new process being able to tell um, Māori stories in a futuristic way. And so um, it really came together and we had the help of a lot of really talented individuals. Um, and that's Jamie Ann. She's one of the artists in the song. So it's also her debut. But um but yeah, I guess like in terms of where we're going, like it's a really cool starting point to be able to start a conversation of like, um, you know, we we really need some talented people in the industry to um, help us, I guess, like thrive. And also just like in terms of the content that we're creating, um, there's a whole thing around empowerment through content. So that's sort of our, our kaupapa, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I know we kind of dropped a whole bunch of different concepts and a whole bunch of visuals on you guys, but if any of this stuff sort of resonates um, with you, then, you know, there's our website if you want to contact us or we'll be floating around after this if there's room for to have recorded any of you guys. But really appreciate you guys um, coming to this event and giving us a platform to be able to speak. And I hope you guys have I don't know, enjoyed some of the cool and that you have an awesome nice night. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Yes. Awesome. I'll talk loud. I'm used to it. I'm going to make sure. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, answer that question back to front, I guess, with what we're trying to achieve with the digital screen campus and then come back. So, um, you know, I think the, the presentations from Shakti and, and Madison and, and Vincent were awesome because they basically represent a lot of the co we're trying to bring in through the digital screen campus, which is really, we have sort of foundation and scaffolds. The foundation is it's around convergence. And I love Chuck the your, your graph of everything going together because that's really what we're trying to do. So the digital screen campus uh, and the digital screen degree that we have brings together cinematic arts or filmmaking. It brings together game development, game arts, screen sound, screenwriting, animation, and a world first minor in indigenous narrative. With the idea that we're really looking for uh, these areas of convergence in in storytelling. And you know, I think Madison talked about that a lot with the the virtual production, how we're bringing together game engines, film. All these sorts of things as new ways of storytelling, which is the the other uh, scaffolding of the degree is that everything is based around how we tell stories. So the digital screen campus is basically built around that framework. There's some red pamphlets I came because why not network and, and show our stuff off. So you see some little, little red pamphlets if you're you're more interested in the degree. But that's sort of I guess from the educational perspective, which is where I'm at. But the digital screen campus is much more than just an educational program. So. Um, you know, Vincent said about how, uh, you know, a lot of the work in, in film and stuff and gaming and everything is being done up in the North Island, but it doesn't have to be. We have so much going on in, in the South Island, Te Wapunu, and what we really want the digital screen campus to be is to be that kind of anchor that brings everyone into Ototahi and Te Wapunu and say, this is, you know, we can do this as well as anyone anywhere around the world. So we're starting with film, gaming, virtual production, uh, screenwriting, storytelling, all these sorts of things. But obviously, I guess the, the, the call out to the large business community is these things don't stand alone either. Um, we'll be looking at, at opportunities for uh, you know, other technologies which can be brought in, other methods of storytelling. You know, I'm sure any, everyone here has their own story to tell about their business, about their journeys, about their paths. But also you know, the, the services which sit around these things, you know, they don't exist in isolation. They need accountants, they need lawyers, they need technology and all that sort of stuff. So, I guess that's my my far too long 30 second overview of so what we're going to do. I'll pass it over to someone else. Fantastic. I want to reiterate the same question to you, Petrina, from your experience as being in the industry and also getting to do you want to pick that? Yeah, cool. And also getting to uh, because you've been just six months here in the city, right? And all, already picked up a lot of reins and had an understood of the ecosystem of sorts. So what is your perception in terms of what is like you know what the city can actually produce? in terms of being close to a Hollywood epicenter like Wellington and how is Screen Canterbury, sorry, Screen Crashers doing it? Screen Canterbury. Go, 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 go. You have 30 seconds. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I joined as a screen manager from the past year being a producer and being on set is very different from being in the office and trying to attack production. So what I found is that the being a producer also helped me understand what's out there, how to reach out to producers and what can be on the map. But honestly, can be already on the map. Like, you know, my visit to Kanto here this year just um, made me realize that producers are so aware of New Zealand. They love filming, they love the locations, they love South Island, you know. Um, they are getting more and more attracted to what we have to offer and, and now putting the digital screen campus on the map and telling them that we also have this is just amplifying that voice. Um, yes, the role is to attract productions, to facilitate those productions, to see that you know our crew is busy all the time, back to back. And the good thing is um, that we announced a screen grant earlier last year, and that has just done wonders for the region. It's attracted feature films after many years. Like I think the first film that the first feature film that's being filmed right now, there are four days to wrap, is come to the region after three years. And we only, we're only growing from here. We've got five more productions in the pipeline, so can be going to be super busy. Mm -hmm. And we are definitely, definitely got our eyes on the bigger slice of the pie, and we want to take a whole end. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what we're doing. We're just trying to you know, make sure that all our strengths are amplified and together with the screen campus and the screen office, we're doing just that. Fantastic. So this is regarding the question about um, the particular thing that you guys have done. Mm. So the character Mad Maggie, so which they will talk about, we don't have to 
put the audio on. So Mad Maggie is a character from a game called Apex Legends, which is developed by an American studio called Respawn Entertainment and became one of the most authentic Maori or indigenous characters in the mainstream game sector. So your Maoistry has designed the character, mm. like, you know, as such from here. Uh, and uh, so I, the question around for me is like, you know, in the, in the era of cultural misappropriation of t like, you know, the game studios or different kind of immersive co companies trying to reciprocate something uh, and misappropriating culture, why is the inclusion of indigenous and minority cultural elements in these stories important in the revitalization and inclusion of these communities? Yeah, awesome. Um, I think it's a really hot topic and something that's really important um, to talk about. Um, I think it's so important because, well, for instance, I think it leads to a better design outcome. So it's more authentic, right? Like, um, whenever you want to do something well, you kind of go as close to the source as you possibly can. Um, there's no reason why that shouldn't be the same for culture. Um, and if you look at like a comparison between the first design there was, which was like a Gibraltar character, which is like a melting pot of just heaps of different random stuff that you can tell that they just grabbed off of the internet. Like people notice that, like individuals from those individual cultures, they noticed their own symbols and how that they were put with other different concepts and whatnot mm -hmm. and saw how they didn't really connect with one another. And so I think it's like an organization of that size. It's, it's actually a bit of a risk. Um, mm. to do things like that because like yeah the internet's a smart place you know people are aware of things people talk and that's exactly what happened with that particular character is people started to talk and they started to diminish the mm. reputation of EA of Respawn of <laughs> all those guys so um, but then if you really think about the design it's not like to brag as an organization mm. um, the designers are so much better um, and that that's because like, you know, it wasn't because that Maui Studios did it ourselves, but we approached it as a community. Mm -hmm. And even when it comes to Maui Studios being the Maori organization doing Maori projects, um, we ourselves have to check ourselves and get as close to the source as possible. So some of the examples were around the iwi stories, you know, we ourselves traveled to those individual spaces. We spent time with the families, um, mm -hmm. their matua, their storytellers, their kids and stuff like that. We spent time on their marae around their wahi tapu or sacred sites and spent multiple days yeah, just to soak up the essence of who they were, yeah. their particular dialect, all those sorts of things. And um, it's just getting as close to the source as possible. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it gives a sense of authenticity in terms of Absolutely. that. And also including a voice actor from Taranaki, if I'm yeah, right, yeah, for also sure. adds uh, uh, like an element of authenticity. My second mm -hmm. question to you is like, you know, how do you think, like, you know, uh, uh, whatever you, you guys are doing are gonna bridge the digital divide in the next generation of sorts and how it's going to inspire them. Absolutely, so because we got to spend time with them, we got to demystify the process for getting characters from being just a thing that's in your mind and getting it into the hands of their millions of you know, users. Um, so it was cool to kind of show this is actually how you go about creating something like that. And then just the nature of Maui Studios, you know, we do a lot of like tour kind of tainer relationships or working with young people or interns. Um, we bring them along for the journey. So the artists that work on Mad Maggie, they were straight out of Toy Hokura. They were young artists who had just learned about digital technologies. And so we got to sit them in the same meetings mm. with all the lead of design and lead of animation, the lead of concept with those big organizations as well. So it's like just proximity to those awesome individuals and yeah, just creating opportunities for others to come along the journey as well. And the more involved them, you know, the wider community is, the more that everyone gets to celebrate those wins instead yeah. of it just being a few. So that's good. I think that sort of approach definitely helps. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. The next question is, we're going to take the mic back. Uh, <laughs> no, to you. Uh, you can't escape the question. Um, so one of the other questions is, like, you know, people consider the technology to be very expensive, like you know, considering the resources, skills, and thing. But what kind of a suggestion do you have in terms of communicating how it can be less expensive and the value that can deliver? interesting uh, question because uh, yes to produce such quality work and in, in, in this emerging technology you need to equip yourself with uh, the the latest uh, talent and it, they are quite expensive they don't come cheap <laughs> <laughs> second thing is uh, it, it is expensive uh, but most people think you know, uh, I mean, this is a pers this is the general assumption with the industry. Uh, this is innovation, classified as innovation, which means it is expensive. It should be expensive. But the way we are tackling is, we wanted to subsidize the risk. We don't want to subsidize the price. 
So what, what does it mean? You know, are, you, are you guys getting cheaper? No, it's not about cheaper. It's actually giving this opportunity for those companies or individuals to take a risk. To take the risk, you know, they have limited budget within their organization. So what we do, try to do is co-create with them. So we try to co-create with them, achieve something small in the scale within the budget, uh, but it is something that they can take it back and come back again. So most of our clients are recurring clients. I know that this is on a, not on a first date. You don't propose on a first date. So <laughs> that's the same, same philosophy. So we don't try to sell anything on the first meet. So it's always like the IP problem. They come back and say, oh, you know what, where is the IP sits? Can we have this completely? There's another model that we came up with, shared IP. So you don't pay for the exclusivity, rather we share the exclusivity with others. So find a like-minded organization and have a shared project and shared IP. It's quite challenging, but that's the two approach that we are uh, having, which is why we could expand and experiment with different uh, industry and different organization. Thank you. Katrina. Um, I think the other question, like, you know, I think we, Adrian, you and Matt, we, what to you, the question is to you. <laughs> we met in the NZ, no, nobody, everyone's trying to defeat the question. Uh, we met in the NZ, NZ GDC, which is New Zealand Green Developers Conference that happens every year. And like, you know, that's where the majority of the industry that like now affiliates with film production and cross reality and everyone meets there. So it's kind of a bigger event actually. So you are there, like, you know, what is the observation in terms of where Canterbury Crisis stands? compared against the different uh, industries? Like, you know, what is the general outcome of the event? So that we can... I yeah. think what I took away from it was that I was filming in the digital yes. age, because I was still using green, even if it was four years ago, we have green screen and, you know, and <laughs> film is ever evolving. Every year there's a new technology. And that was my first uh, event that I had been for to look at media convergence, and it just blew my mind. You know, as a filmmaker, uh, as a Bollywood filmmaker, I've done a lot of filming on location and a lot of filming on green screen. We haven't, I haven't been on a virtual production set. The first virtual production set was the one that when I came in, I had seen um, the screen grant had given uh, resonate some uh, funding and you know, that they had that film and that was my, my, um, my initiation to virtual production. And I thought this was, this is amazing. And how come Bollywood hasn't picked it up? Because you know, we are, one of the biggest, largest producing nations. Um, and at the game dev, it just sealed that this is the future and that you have to, you know, that's why I go along. I've already met with Maui Studios and, and you know, meeting people. It's a learning curve for me to try and bring them all together and to see how, through the screen grant, we can also help virtual productions and not just normal film producers. So I think it's a big learning curve for me right now. Fantastic, thank you. To, to the last person in the row. So again, like, you know, going back to the NZGDC, like, you know, what is your observation in terms of like, you know, what you saw and how, in terms of either academic or industry-wise, how can we improve our facilities or like, you know, outside the skill set in Christchurch and Canterbury? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, interestingly enough, I went because I'm a, well, originally a computer scientist, but I, I teach game development now. So I went to NZGDC, but since I was there, I thought I'd go to the Convergence Day because that's what the digital screen is about. Uh, but I actually found it way more interesting than the game dev meetup, I have to be honest, um, because I felt like there was a lot more, there's a lot more innovation going on there, which is, you know, I, I'm originally a researcher, uh, and a lot of the game dev was like case studies on we built this game and here's what worked and here's what didn't, which is, is great, but there wasn't a lot of innovation, there wasn't necessarily a lot of novelty, whereas going to Convergence Day, there was a whole bunch of companies being like, we've got this new toy, Called virtual production, no one really understands how it works, and everyone's just trying to trying to throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And I know that's been going on here. So um, Maui and, and those guys have their own virtual production volume that they're working on. Um, Katrina mentioned the work that Simon did. So that was that was actually a great case study. I don't know, I just bad case studies, but I'm going to do it myself. Um, yeah, that was a great case study for us because we had Cerebral Fix, a game development company. We had Resonate, which is a, a local film production company. We had Pixel, who provided screens mm. over on our Dovedale campus, and we set up a virtual production thing. And we just tried stuff, and mm. the project almost failed until uh, at the last second we were able to swap out some of the tracking technology. But it was great for us as academics, as researchers, because you know we were able to see industry doing what they do best and actually being able to join in as, as academics, as researchers, sort of doing what we do best. And I think that's, that's sort of an opportunity where 
Um, I'm really excited about kind of what's going on in, in Christchurch because I feel like there's a lot of that uh, unity and, and people are working together, they're coming together to, to share their learning and stuff like that, which is something I didn't necessarily feel so much at Convergence. Like everyone was talking about the work they've done, but it's like, this is the work we've done, and the next person would get up and say, this is the work we've done. Whereas I feel like there's a lot more, you know, we've, we've got Jix and Maui working together and saying, look, we've both got our strengths. Mm. And I think that's something which Christchurch does, which maybe isn't done as well elsewhere. And yeah, is Thank that you. a wrap up, is it? Yeah. Or? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I was, I was, I was <laughs> clapping for the Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I thank you. It's all right. I know I tend to go on and on. <laughs> no, no, no. That was good. It was good because we need to, like, because every time we, we have this conversation, like, you know, we are trying to question the Christchurch or Canterbury things compared to the other, other regions. So that's a perspective that we have and that we want to share with you guys as such of how well we are doing and the steps that we have to take further to uh, build the connection uh, for the next stage of uh, screen cross reality and virtual production. So uh, that is Adrian, and he runs the uh, he designs the co digital screen campus thing. <laughs> Just throw some words out there. Something yeah. I understand. No, 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 no. <laughs> New bachelor of digital screen degree. So we have the templates and the plans. If you, anyone is interested to find out what kind of course I was going to offer, please take the brochure on the front. And that is Petrina. If somebody's interested in terms of talking about the screen campus collaboration. And talk to her, Shakti, so Jix, so you know, and you can talk, and <laughs> Vincent Egan Vincent. is my name, <laughs> <laughs> just in case you forgot it. <laughs> okay. So Vincent, if you want to talk about Maori or any other innovation uh, that you guys are doing. But besides that, thank you everyone for being present on the panel. supposed to give wine. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take it The next Lunchtime Tech Session is a presentation on creating a great digital workplace by Steve Knutson, Director at Stratos Technology Partners. This will be held on Tuesday the 20th of September at 12.30pm online. The next Canterbury Tech event is in October. This will be the last monthly event for 2022. It will be held at The Loft, 146A Litchfield Street. The theme is Food, Fiber and Agritech. This will be held on Tuesday the 4th of October, 5.30 till 7.30pm. We look forward to seeing you there.